guest, we will discuss youth engagement and leadership. So Asma Rabia, you are Global Focal Point um, at SDG7 Youth uh, Constituency. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me with you. <laughs> um, maybe could you first of all kind of share your personal journey and how it has shaped your passion for energy and also youth advocacy? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Asma Rupaya. So happy to be here in this interview to share about my uh, background and um, uh, my experience in the energy space. So uh, I'm from the Tunisian Algerian border. Some people mistake for me being Algerian, but I'm Tunisian. And um, yeah, I was born and raised in a very small town. It's a, like an underserved community that has like a strong tie with um, with uh, with Algeria, and they call it the land of brotherhood between Tunisia and Algeria. And uh, in my community, since a very young age, I've been uh, passionate about helping others, finding solutions for my community, and uh, of course, uh, studying hard because I've always uh, believe that education is what would um, enable me to achieve those dreams and help my community and other people and um, and also with the issues in my community I noticed uh, the importance of energy for schools for uh, hospitals for households and uh, that's how I got very interested in the energy space uh, when I wanted to go to college I wasn't encouraged to pursue like a STEM degree, especially engineering. And they were like, oh, it's such a hard path and you need to go and you need to sit for the national exam. And then there is an employment in this um, field. So that was very discouraging for me. And I did one year of engineering and I was like, oh, maybe I need to switch, even though I wanted to be an engineer and I wanted to uh, work in the energy space. And then I switched to business, which is something completely different. And that was like something challenging for me uh, to know how I can innovate, how I can find solutions and how I can uh, contribute, not as an engineer, but as a, as a business person or uh, someone who can ideate or someone who can um, innovate. Yeah. How, how's your background kind of influenced, um, you know, your perspective on the importance of, of energy equity um, and equitable access to energy? Sure. Um, so when I was young, I noticed like how each year a lot of my classmates would drop out of school and I would be wondering, oh, where's this friend? Where's this classmate? And uh, when I uh, ask about them or when I meet them during certain occasions, um, they would tell me that the conditions are very harsh uh, especially in the dorms or them coming to school and um, they just decided to quit and many uh, many of the girls they got married at, a, at an early age and that's something that made me very sad because I believe that they need to pursue the, their education because that's their hope that's the hope that they have and then I started to like look around me and analyze what are these these issues and I noticed it's an energy, it's an energy issue because if they had at the dorm like good conditions, if they had warm water, if they had heating, then they wouldn't, they wouldn't drop out of school. They this would... was a, like a boarding school. Yeah. In... Okay. So they were not leaving at home. Yeah. So those like harsh conditions made them quit on their dreams. And that's something that made me very sad. And then in college and business, we had like uh, the the competitions and uh, I was always interested to think of solutions related to energy like the Halt Prize, uh, other regional competitions uh, like in jazz and uh, one of the competitions I took part of was Accelerate MENA uh, for Middle East and North Africa with GIZ and um, my, my idea was one of the winning um, ideas and I got the chance to go for a global impact meeting of um, like uh, like innovators from all around the globe and that's something that inspired me a lot and made me believe that I can make a change and I can contribute to the energy transition. 
So now you are a global focal point at SDG 7, the youth constituency. Yes. Tell us more about your work and what exactly is SDG 7. Uh, so the SDG 7 youth constituency is part of the major group for uh, children and youth. MGCY, which is mandated by the UN General Assembly. And for our constituency, uh, we focus on uh, mainstreaming youth action in uh, the energy uh, the energy space. Of course, uh, the effort of how to say establishing this constituency is not like my credit. There are a lot of people that I would say like the hidden gems of the constituency, those who contributed to establishing it and now uh, the constituency having the success or the impact it has on young people. And uh, I really appreciate those young people who put their time and effort because it's not easy when you are a young person building your life to dedicate so much of time and effort into building such such initiative that would impact uh, young people. So um, with uh, there with me, my colleague, David, David Arenzi from Nigeria. We are uh, two global focal points. Our mandate is for two years. We also have coordination team with us, regional focal points to ensure there's the regional representation, there are thematic focal points like humanitarian energy, gender, energy access, et cetera. And we also have working groups that will help us uh, address energy issues like policy, monitoring, and evaluation, etc. Can you share perhaps some success stories where sustainable energy projects, um, you know, significantly improved the, the lives of, of people on the ground? Sure. Um, in terms of the constituency, one of the uh, successful initiatives we had in the past years was the Youth Sustainable Energy Hub, and the purpose was to map Youth, um, youth-led and youth-serving initiatives in the energy space, and these uh, initiatives were um, like linked to policy and advocacy, capacity building, entrepreneurship, and business. And the projects are very inspiring. They operate at the local, regional, and global level. And also, one of the initiatives that um, inspires me personally a lot: a uh, Regent project with uh, UN Esqua. It's a um, it's a project on small scale renewable energy uh, projects in the Arab region, and this project especially empowers young females and females in general in the Arab region. And uh, listening to the testimonials of this um, project, how women in rural areas say that now they have an income, now they can spend on their families, now they know about renewable energy, now they can use it for their households and their businesses. It's something very, uh, very inspiring. Yeah. Why and, and how should the youth, um, you know, contribute to sustainable energy solutions? Um, and in the work that you've done, how do you see that? So youth are impacted, as I mentioned. Um, our lives are heavily impacted by, by energy. Myself, when I go back to my hometown, I feel even my uh, productivity gets reduced a lot. And it's something that I feel even if I go to somewhere with with more uh, like with better, let's say, uh, equipment or uh, facilities, and I would still feel sorry for my community, for my family, for my friends. And as young people, we need like uh, good access to energy to be able to do our studies, to do our jobs and um, also for us like to have decent jobs uh, because there's high unemployment rates globally for young people in the Arab region, in Africa, and globally. And we need to address this and the energy sector can uh, provide many job opportunities for young people. You um, were in Dubai for COP28. Um, how was your experience of, of youth engagement during COP28? Sure. Uh, so COP28 this year had uh, like a strong representation of young people and especially the children in youth pavilion was very vibrant. I personally was very inspired that I saw young children uh, speaking like their different uh, languages, French, Arabic, and there were like translators there helping their these children convey their messages. 
And uh, like given this space for young people to connect with each other and to share about the different initiatives they are working on then, and their work in their local communities is very inspiring for each other, but also giving the space for them to be engaged in high level uh, discussions in different, uh, different pavilions and main sessions, it's something very crucial. But this should not be just like for the show or tokenism. There should be meaningful youth engagement during COP or other processes and the and the energy space and climate action in general. Based on, on your experience at COP, what strategies do you plan to implement in Tunisia and in the Arab world and more broadly to ensure effective youth involvement in addressing climate change and, and the energy transition? Uh, what I've been told uh, that the major decisions are not like made, let's say, in the big conferences, but they are made in those small rooms. And I personally want young people like myself to be um, to be given the space to be part of those uh, small discussions that um, that help or that formulate the the big policies. So engaging with local actors. So for me, um, at, during COP, I connected with uh, actors in Tunisia, like the Tunisian Agency of Energy Conservation, uh, the uh, Tunisia Focal Point for UNFCCC to see how we can amplify the work at the national level for youth engagement in uh, energy and climate. And we're working in, on this also with the Regional Commission for the UN, with UN ESCO on how we can have meaningful youth engagement for, um, for like for Tunisia and for the, for the region in general. Um, just to talk a bit more about kind of the youth climate movement um, and more generally, um, a few years ago when the Fridays for Future movement began, there was this huge interest in, in the youth movement and the role of young people. Um, how relevant is this notion still today um, in climate action? And I, I, I wonder because now we are seeing young people in positions of power, decision makers. And so why, I mean, if young people are in a way at the negotiating table, why do you get this feeling that we still need more youth engagement? Is it still relevant? What we need is, since we are talking about equity and marginalized community, and there should be a strong emphasis on representation, because, for example, myself, I cannot speak on behalf of someone who's living in a refugee camp and about their conditions. So we need to have, there are so many young people in this world, and we need to amplify their voices more. It's not like just me, David, and other people, there should be many and we need those people to come to these tables and share with us their experiences, their realities, and what's and what are their challenges, what are their needs, and what are their asks, because they are the ones struggling, so we need to hear from them. That's why we always ask for more representation for uh, young people and to focus on equity, that these young people did not get the opportunities and they are facing so many challenges within their community to get even like visas to come to conferences to speak or to get funding. So we need to address these issues and have more young people to uh, convey their voices. Essentially, it's not because you have a young leader, um, that young leader will cater to the needs of young people. <laughs> Yeah, we need we need like more more uh, young. It's like similar to training of trainers. Uh, we we try to train other other young people, but we also want them to be on uh, these stages to deliver their realities. What advice would you give to you know um, young people aspiring to become leaders and promoting clean energy and equitable access to to energy? Uh, I have many. <laughs> so I would say believe in yourself because um, there are many challenges that we face, especially when we're young and if we are from an underserved community, there are many challenges that we face, as I mentioned, like uh, f like access to finance, to, to go like to certain places we want, um, visas and uh, other challenges, even with our families and our communities and uh, cultural sensitivities. So we need to like 
believe in what we want and uh, believe in our passions, we also need to be inspired by other young people. Myself, when I was uh, younger, I used to always like go and attend TED Talks and those like motivational conferences to to listen to people's stories and their journeys and learn uh, and learn from them. Like even a um, few minutes ago, listening to Demi Lola's story um, and per her personal story is very inspiring. And we always like keep learning and we learn a lot from human beings. And the other aspect is to also work hard because for, for us as young people, if we want to make decision makers listen to us, we need to be persistent. We need to work hard. We need to like keep pursuing them. We need to keep approaching them. We need to keep putting effort. And also we need to work together because if as young people, we do not work together, then our work will not be collective and we will not be able to convince um, the, the decision makers or world leaders to take action. In order to move the needle, where would you like to see more young people in, in advocacy, in, in politics, in, in business world? Um, where do you think we need the voice of young people the most? I believe we need it everywhere. We need it in advocacy and uh, we need it in the, the business space. We need like young entrepreneurs and uh, business leaders but we need to equip them first because this is what young people are afraid of always that how to take the first step. And that's why we need like mentorship and we need support from senior people, people and senior leaders. Uh, we need to see them in technical positions and we need, um, we need them the, since here at the ministerial, we have like ministers and we have these um, like important organizations. We need, them to give you the space to learn and to have like traineeship internships at their organizations to be able to to see how things are happening and how they can contribute because they will be the ones taking uh, the lead and they if they are not prepared then we we can see where the word is going so we need them to have the opportunity to learn and uh, we need them also to convey their voices and we need the decision makers to listen to their voices and not feel, oh, these are just young people. Let's just, um, that what they're saying doesn't make sense. What would be, um, you know, your message to decision makers uh, in terms of empowering youth? Uh, I want them to really listen uh, to young people and not like consider us um, as, had to say decoration uh, in meetings or conferences that we really like have a say and uh, we we have our our needs so we need them to uh, to include us in their uh, in their policies and their decisions and their projects whenever there's uh, an initiative an important uh, project that they are working on that we need them to include young people and to consult us and to include us in their decisions. Um, I, again, it's the same question that I asked uh, before that I wanna ask you. Um, so if you had uh, this magic wand and could change anything for a more sustainable planet, what would you do? Uh, I want equity for everyone. I want everyone to, to have like same access to equal access to opportunities and not to leave like anyone behind because now our world is facing so many crises, conflict, refugees, and many other crises. And of course, this is linked to, um, to sustainability and energy. And I want everyone to have like a good life, everyone to be able to give their full potential, especially young people, and for them uh, to be able to make their voices heard. Thank you so much for being here today, Asma, Arabia, and for sharing your story. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.